Welcome to In His Name, a podcast recorded on the mission fields of Africa by law graduate turned crusade evangelist Tamron Clintworth. Get ready to be empowered and inspired for mountain moving endeavors. Here is Tamron. Warmest greetings from South Africa. I am absolutely thrilled to be recording the very first episode of this podcast. And since it is our first episode, I thought it would be a good idea for me to share a little bit more with you about myself. It is important that you get to know a bit more about me before we start diving into the Word of God together. And so let us pray and then we will get going. Precious Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy, Holy Spirit, We love you, we adore you, and we worship you. Thank you for this time that we get to spend together. And I thank you that it would be life-changing. That you would would flood wherever my listeners are. You would flood their their cars, their, their homes, wherever they may be, their offices that you would be with them during this time that we spend together, that they would feel your power and your presence, that you would inspire them, encourage them, and equip them, that this would be a very special time that they spend with you. Lord, this is your platform, this is your pulpit, that every word that I speak drip with you. Let it be edifying, let it be uplifting, let it be truth. So thank you, Almighty God. We love you. We worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So where shall we start? Let's start with how I got saved. That is actually a very simple story. It was in children's church. And this is a bit of encouragement to all you children's church teachers out there. The children's church teacher in my Sunday school class would do an altar call for salvation every Sunday. And so the one Sunday I responded. I remember thinking to myself, I don't know everything about this Jesus, but he sounds absolutely wonderful and I want him. I am going to invite him to come and live in my heart. And so I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember marching down to the front, praying the salvation prayer. And from that day, I knew that Jesus was inside of me. And the Lord was good to me. He kept me. He kept me to himself. He carried on drawing me closer and closer to him. And then it was in early high school that I really had my first encounter with him so to speak. I was always very honest with the Lord and I had an honest conversation with him one day. I said, Lord, I don't love you the way I know I should love you. I said to him, Lord, preachers, they always say that I should love you more than I love anybody and anything else. But I don't. I said, Jesus, I don't love you more than I love my parents. I don't, I don't treasure our relationship more than I treasure my relationships with my friends, but I want to. I want to love you in that way. I want to treasure you in that way. Please help me. Show yourself to me. Show me your love. I want to be in love with you. Oh, and the Lord was so good to me, as of course, he is always good to those who ask him for something with a sincere heart. After all, it was our Lord who said, if you seek, you will find. If you ask, you will be answered. If you knock, the door will be opened. And so I asked and the Lord answered. It was probably a couple of months after I had made that request and I was in church during worship, raising my hands, closing my eyes as I had been trained to do from a young child, trying my best to focus on Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, I felt this love, this love that was so thick and that was so heavy. I had never experienced anything like it. This love wrapped itself around me like a blanket and it 
permeated me. It saturated me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. It absolutely infiltrated me. And I knew, I knew this was Jesus. This was the love that he had for me, the love that he has for me. This was Jesus showing me his love. And I responded to that love. And in that moment, I not only felt the love that he had for me, but I fell back in love with him. And that that feeling, that love feeling, him being in love with me, me knowing that reality and me falling back in love with him became my permanent state of being until this day and forever. <laughs> I pray it will be so. I know his love. I can feel his love and I, I love him more than anyone and anything. And I was very grateful. I am very grateful to the Lord. I will forever be grateful to him that he allowed me to have that experience with him as a young teenager. Because it was that that really then kept me on the straight and narrow during those, those, those tumultuous teenage years. Those years during which many young Christian slips off the path of righteousness and makes bad decisions and and gives into peer pressure because of that love encounter I didn't want to disappoint him I I couldn't bring myself to disappointing him I I wanted to please him I wanted to make him proud I wanted to make him happy and so I stuck to the straight and narrow as best as I could I did my best to please him and and I am so grateful to him for that, that I don't look back at my teenage years and have regrets, well, no big ones, <laughs> at least. I felt a pull to ministry from those early teenage years, but I always assumed that it would be ministering to believers for the simple reason that, in my mind, I had never been an unbeliever. When you give your heart to the Lord at the age of five and and you, you, you stick to the course. You know, you, you have no memories of what it was like to be trapped in darkness. To be a slave of the devil. To be a slave of sin. And so in my mind, the Lord wouldn't be able to use me to minister to unbelievers. Because I couldn't relate to them. I thought they would give me one look up and down and say, You goody two-shoes little Christian. You don't know what I've been through. You can't preach to me. How do you know that your Jesus can save me? And so I made an assumption. And assumptions are very dangerous to make, especially with the Lord when they are assumptions that are concocted by our own thoughts and assumptions that are not based on the word of God. So I made an assumption. The Lord wasn't going to use me to minister to unbelievers. He was going to use me to minister to believers you know, to, to draw them into a deeper relationship with the Lord, to teach them about his love, his, his Holy Spirit. That was in my mind how the Lord would use me in ministry. But God didn't give me any specific direction what, what next step he wanted me to take to start this, this ministry path. And so by the time I got into the the final year of my of my school studies, I needed to choose what degree um, to take, what degree to study, what what tertiary education to enter into. And I was raised in a very academic home. My father is German, first of all, and secondly, he has his doctorate in engineering from the University of London. And so my sister and I were always raised with the understanding that we would go to university after school and we would study, we would get degrees behind our names and then we could carry on with our lives. And so I picked a degree and I had always enjoyed languages and the Lord had blessed me with a good academic brain. I enjoyed studying and so I picked law. I thought, well, a law degree can't hurt. The Lord can always use it. Worst case scenario, if I don't end up in this field, so let me start with a law degree and I will see what the Lord directs me to do after that. 
And so I started at the University of Johannesburg. It was a four-year, what we call an LLB degree. Uh, and I started studying um, very diligently. I started doing courses at a local Bible school. I started studying biblical Greek as well on the side. And I just carried on spending time with Jesus, spending time in the word of God, praying, just drawing closer and closer to him. And as a little side note, friend, if you are listening and you say, Tamron, I haven't really found yet where I fit. You know, I haven't yet discovered, you know, that that place where the Lord wants me. You know, I haven't yet discovered what he has created me to accomplish for him. Then, friend, the best advice I can give to you is keep on drawing closer to him. Keep your eyes on him. Give him your heart. Keep on spending time in prayer. Keep on spending time in his word. Work on your relationship with him. And also, whatever you can do right now, whatever job you are in, whatever work you have in your hands to do, do that with excellence. Put your back into it. Strive for excellence. Give it your best. Give that task your best. And the Lord will see the faithfulness. And as you draw closer and closer to him, as you learn better how to hear his voice, as you get to know him more, and as he sees you applying yourself in that field that you are currently in and giving it your best, even though your heart might not be completely in it, you're giving it your best regardless and you are being faithful, faithful with that that perhaps is another man's. He will then see that you are trustworthy and he will speak to you and he will open doors and he will guide you and he will direct you and he will raise you up until you find your rhythm and until you really you really stumble upon exactly what he has created you to accomplish for him and so i carried on drawing closer and closer to jesus i applied myself in my studies i i gave it my all you know and those those textbooks any any of my listeners who maybe also have law degrees behind their names, you know how thick those textbooks are. It should be illegal for them to be that thick. I applied myself, did my best, and I carried on. I carried on waiting to hear from the Lord, waiting for him to give me further direction, further instruction. And then it was in the penultimate year of my degree that my mother, was invited to be a guest at a crusade of evangelist Reinhard Bonker of Christ for All Nations. She had befriended the Southern African director of Christ for All Nations, a wonderful woman who now happens to be my mother-in-law, but that is a different story for a different time. She had befriended this wonderful lady by the name of Tia, and Tia was taking a group to one of the Sifan Crusades, to Abuja, Nigeria. My mother had always wanted to attend a Christ for All Nations Crusade. She had followed the ministry of Evangelist Reinhard Bonker for many, many years, and she wanted to go along with and experience a crusade. But she needed a roommate, and she didn't want to share with a stranger, so she invited me to go with her as her roommate. I was very curious. I had also heard a lot about Evangelist Reinhard Bonker and the Crusades and the Salvations and the miracles and the mass baptisms in the Holy Spirit. And so I tagged along. I remember it was early on in my university year, and so I could slip away. I could miss a couple of classes without too many dire consequences. And so I went with my mother to that crusade. And on the first night, it was a Wednesday night, and on the first night, the guests were ushered up onto the stage. There was Evangelist Reinhard Bonke. He greeted us. I remember that he apologized for the crowd being so small. He promised that it would grow. I looked out at the crowd. A hundred thousand people had gathered. 
It was the biggest crowd that I had ever seen in my life. I didn't understand what he was saying. How could he label this crowd as being small? Well, by the final night, it had grown to over half a million. So 100,000 was a starter crowd indeed. And we sat down, the service started, it was all very new, all very thrilling, all very exciting. And then Evangelist Bonker was handed the microphone to start his sermon. And those of you who, who knew Evangelist Bonker, who followed his ministry, remember that he would always start with a characteristic hallelujah that would, would make every demon knock together. It felt like the ground was shaking and he bellowed this hallelujah and I, I just started weeping uncontrollably. I was having a visceral reaction to what this man was doing and I didn't understand because I was no crybaby. You know, I'm half German. I know how to keep my emotions under control most of the time, at least, at least when it comes to crying. And I'm not a big crier. I don't often shed tears. And the way that I was weeping, this was not me. This was, this was God. Everything inside of me was responding to what Evangelist Bonker was doing. And I didn't understand why I was responding in this way. I kept on, I kept on speaking to the Lord in my heart and saying, Lord, I don't understand why is everything in me connecting with what he is doing. He is, he is winning the lost. He is preaching to the unsaved. But Lord, you can't use me to preach to the unsaved. I, I can't relate to the unsaved. Lord, you are going to use me to preach to believers, not to unbelievers. It's always so funny when we argue with the Lord. Well, I was an absolute mess. I stopped trying to wipe away the tears with tissues because there was no point. They just kept on coming. And I was a mess in service after service. I knew the Lord was doing something. I wasn't sure if I liked what he was doing, but I knew he was at work in me. He was at work in me. And the final service came. The guests all got the opportunity to go up in what in what is called a, a cherry picker or a genie. It's a it's a little a little box connected to a crane and the crane lifts the little box up about three stories and the the Christ for All Nations photographers use it to get those incredible panoramic crowd shots and the guests got an opportunity to go up in this little device which was an incredible experience and my turn came and I steadied myself in this little box and the crane lifted me up and everything shakes and shudders. So you don't go up if you're scared of heights, that's for sure. And the little box reached its highest point and I looked down at the crowd, half a million people, the stage, the, the whole setting, everything that was happening. A gospel crusade in Africa in all its matchless glory and the Lord spoke to me with such clarity not with an audible voice but with a voice on the inside that was so crystal clear that was so direct that was that was so power packed that my insides shook and the Lord spoke to me and he said do you want this and I knew what he was saying to me I knew I knew, I knew he was saying, Tamron, this is why I created you. Crusade evangelism in Africa, this is the reason why you were born. This is your calling. I have created you to do this. But you have to say yes. You have to say yes. You have to make a decision right now, right now. You have to decide do you say yes? Do you pick up the calling? Do you pick up the baton? Do you pick up the assignment? Do you pick up the task? Or do you say no and go back to your law studies? Go back to a comfortable life with a nice corner office and a beautiful house and a white picket fence? What do you choose? This amazes me to this day, my friend, that God gave me a choice and he gives all of us a choice. 
He gave us a choice when we learned about him being savior of the world. For the first time, he gave us the choice. Do we want to accept him as our personal savior or not? But then when we chose him as our personal savior, that is not the end of the choices. And when it comes to picking up the task, the assignment that he has created us to to complete for him, to accomplish for him, he gives us a choice there as well. We have to say yes. And sometimes it's very overwhelming. Actually, most of the time it's very overwhelming. As I've often heard preachers say, and I agree with it 100%, if it is easy, if it is possible, then it is not from God. God always God always asks us to do the impossible because after all, we are not going to do it alone. We are going to do it with him, hand in hand with him. And he is the God of the impossible. And he wants people to look and see that it can only be God because in our own strength, with our own talents, with our own abilities, we could never accomplish what we are accomplishing. And so the Lord gave me a choice and I knew that I had to say yes, it was overwhelming. It was all so new to me. But I I muttered a very soft little okay. <laughs> and I knew, I knew it was enough for him that my, my calling started from that day. I had just stepped into my calling and I came down out of that little box and I headed back to South Africa, still shell-shocked. I had an honest conversation with my dear father and I thank the Lord that he comes from good good missionary stock. his, His ancestors came from Germany as missionaries to South Africa many, many years ago. So he understands the call of the Lord to the mission field. And so we spoke, we came to an agreement, I would finish the degree, and then I could launch out with his blessing. And so I I got back to my law studies, but of course I couldn't just do my law studies. No, 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 I had to start. I had stepped into my calling. My calling was evangelism, crusade evangelism, and I had to get going. I had to get going. I had to take an action step. And so how did I start? Well, I started with one-on-one evangelism. And let me tell you a little secret. And this is very, this is very shameful. And I will forever find it shameful. But I will confess up until that point, my friend, even though I had been a Christian since the age of five, I had never won one soul for the Lord. Not one. I was a closet Christian. I was incredibly private I loved the Lord. I genuinely loved the Lord. But I was too I was too introverted. I was too nervous to open up to unbelievers about him. When I was with believers, I loved speaking about him. As many Christians do, but when I was with unbelievers, my my words got stuck in my throat and fear overwhelmed me. But I realized, I knew the Lord didn't even have to tell me this. I knew that the Lord would never trust me with a crowd. He would never be able to use me to be a crusade evangelist until I had won the one for him, until I could gather the courage to speak to the one. I would never have the courage to preach to a crowd. And so I began. I remember still still getting a little book from Kenneth Copeland Ministries, a little booklet Um, called Welcome to the Family, and that little booklet explains the gospel message. It breaks it down beautifully. So I I studied that little booklet from cover to cover, trying to memorize how to share the gospel with someone. And I would approach the car guards here in South Africa because of our high crime rate. We have men, women who watch the cars in the parking lots of the shopping centers, you know, of the hotels, of gyms. Wherever people may leave their cars, we have people to watch and keep an eye out, you know, for any any crooks and quickly report them to the police. And so I would go to the car guards, 
the car guards in my gym parking lot. That was my favorite hunting ground (laughs) for salvations. And I would approach them one by one, share the gospel with them, falling over my words, making a mess of it half the time. But the Lord is so good. I learned very quickly that as long as I speak from a pure heart and I speak about Jesus and I give it my best, God will take the words, however fumbled they may sound, and he will use them for his glory. And I remember the first person who received the Lord, he was still wearing a bright yellow cap. I prayed the salvation prayer with him, and he walked away smiling from ear to ear in one direction. I walked away smiling from ear to ear in the other direction, and I I kept on saying to myself, it works, it works, the gospel works. You just have to share it, and it works. Friend, you know, we, we put too much emphasis on, you know, the, on making sure we use the right words when we share the gospel. And, you know, for that reason, many of us hold back. We think, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I, what if I make a mess? What if I do more harm than good? Please hear me now, my friend. If you speak about Jesus from the heart, with love, with kindness, with gentleness, you cannot do damage. It is impossible. It is absolutely impossible impossible just speak do your best the lord will use your words what he cannot use are no words at all but if you just give him some words he can use those words and he will use them for his glory and so i ministered to the car guards i ministered to the petrol pump attendants or the gas station attendants. Here in South Africa, we have people who actually fill up our cars with fuel, with petrol, with gas, whatever you call it in your nation. We are quite spoilt in that way. And so I would park my car at a local gas station and I would start ministering to the attendants, you know, one by one, you know, as they they got a break in their work, sometimes to a little group at a time. And I started sharing with them about Jesus. I would get them Bibles, those who did not yet have Bibles, and and drop the Bibles off with them. I then started going into the local schools, the schools that would let me in um, to speak to the kids. You know, I was a law student, so that opened up quite a a few doors for me. And I would say, I want to come in and and speak to your kids about making the right choices, choices that are God-pleasing. You know, if a young person serves God, loves God, they will make better life decisions. And the principals would allow me to speak to the children either in an assembly, a big assembly where they were all gathered together, or I would go class by class, take over their life orientation classes and speak to the kids. And gosh, I have such precious memories of those young people receiving the Lord. You know, even the 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 big the big rugby player in the back row, you know, trying to hide the tears that are are flowing down his cheeks, you know, raising his hand and receiving the Lord. I would would ensure that every student who receives Jesus completes a decision card, gives their personal information, and I would then drop off those decision cards with the local youth pastors in the area. The local youth pastors would follow up the kids. And it was just absolutely wonderful. So I would do all these things in between my law classes. And the Lord was good to me. He helped to keep my grades high because I was spending so much time on the mission field. It's actually only his hand that kept my grades good. I was studying and I was evangelizing, studying and evangelizing. You know, those were my two two focuses. And so I finished the degree and then I... I launched out. Um, I, you know, started having, you know, little little crusades. Actually, while I was studying, I had my first crusade still on a, a local university campus, which was wonderful. But then, you know, once I graduated, I could really get going. I purchased a thousand seater tent. I would have crusades in that little tent. I would have crusades in local community halls. And I was just trying to learn how to plan crusades because crusade planning is not easy. And I was a I was a one woman show. Well, of course, I had the Holy Spirit with me, but I had no team. I had no I had no staff. I had nobody to help me. And I was doing everything, you know, from, 
meeting with the pastors to you know unpacking the chairs paying the bills you know printing the marketing material um, you know I was wearing many many hats you know and then doing the preaching and laying hands on the sick on top of it so it was it was tough going you know and I had many many moments um, of you know discouragement of wanting to give up you know but the Lord has been so faithful and he has he has encouraged me you know I I faced much discouragement from people you know they would look at me and say but You know, you don't have the personality to be a crusade evangelist. You know, as if a crusade evangelist must have a specific personality. (laughs) They would say, oh, but you're a woman. You know, how can God call you to be a crusade evangelist? You know, that that's a that's a domain dominated by men. You know, that that is for men, not for women. Um, But the Lord encouraged me. I knew that he had called me and he was so good to start bringing people alongside me, you know, men and women who believed in the calling and who started laboring with me and today in his name ministries we are we are registered as a non-profit in south africa in ethiopia in america in the united kingdom we have wonderful team members all around the world and we are reaping in harvest after harvest after harvest you know, our, our little crusades, gosh, if there were a few hundred people in the crowd, we, we were thrilled. You know, now we have tens of thousands in a single crowd. The Lord has been so good and he has been, he has been so faithful to us. You know, as we have proved ourselves to be faithful, as we have applied ourselves and done our best he has, he has applied himself and raised us up. And so, friend, that is, that is my story. And I am so excited to be doing this podcast. I was amazed when I, when I announced that this podcast was launching, all the responses that I received. Many of you are very, very excited for this podcast. And I promise it will not disappoint, not because I am anything special, but because our Jesus does not disappoint. And I know that he will use this podcast to to encourage both you and me and to, to help us be better vessels for his glory. Because that is, after all, why we are still here, why he didn't just beam us up to heaven the moment that we received him as Savior. He needs us. He needs us here in our communities, in our workplaces, in our cities, in our nations. He needs us to shine his light into the darkest of places. He needs us to lift up our voices and declare that Jesus saves Jesus heals, Jesus delivers, Jesus sets the captives free, and we will not keep silent. So friend, I hope this has been helpful for you to get to know me a little bit more. So now you know whose podcast you will be listening to, and I'm already excited for the next episode. I am going to start teaching on the Holy Spirit. He is one of my most favorite topics, if we, can, if we can dare to call him a topic. But I love sharing about the Holy Spirit because he, he is the one who makes it possible for us as believers to do any kind of endeavors at all that please the heart of the Father. And the more we get to know him the more we understand him, the more we learn how to work with him, the more effective we can be as vessels in the kingdom. So I will chat to you again next week. Until then, know that I love you and I am praying for you. Go for it. Win your world for Jesus. Thank you for joining us for another episode. Visit inhisname.global today to learn more about our work in Africa and help make our gospel crusades possible through your prayers and giving. Find Tamarin on your favorite social media platform and connect with her. 
remember also to subscribe to this podcast. Until next time, keep on believing in his name.